Welcome to the Pope on Film. I am Bunny Williams, and with me is... My name is Reverend Steve. I am the founder of the Church of Ed Wood. Most times, uh, nowadays, I am... Uh, sometimes, nowadays, I am known as May Lynn. I am the founder of the Church of Ed Wood, the Pope in question. Yes, yes, Little Lebowski, Urban Achievers, and Proud We Are of all of that. This is episode 435 of this podcast, which is quite impressive. Very excited about today. Uh, the, the podcast is going to be starting out very sappy. And then it's going to get very angry. And then eventually we'll get to uh, the discussion of, holy shit, my wife is trying on corsets and... Hachi Mama. Very sparkly. How did... Very sparkly. When did you do this? I don't know. Do you want to lean over here and get us a few more views? <laughs> uh, Am I in the camera? Yeah, hold on. Let me see. Okay. Now try. Kind of. Hey. The Pope on film kicking it up a notch. <laughs> that, that's a reference to the Root Beer show. Once again, Natasha is kicking it up a notch. Uh, and eventually, we'll be getting around to discussing this week's movie, The COVID Killer. It is fascinating to me how every week, every episode this summer, we find ourselves saying, wow, I can't believe that any movie could be worse than the last film we saw. Yes. It really is just a slope downwards. It is incredible because last the last movie we saw, COVID nineteen invasion, starring Kevin Nash in a cameo. Yes, I thought this is without a doubt the worst. Nothing will beat this. And then in comes um, Brooklyn accents the movie. Yes, I just want to. It. I just want to follow Brooklyn like one Brooklyn person around brooklyn for a day and i think that that'd be really interesting you know there is no fucking way in hell at all ever that that was the bronx or brooklyn uh the director i don't give a fuck about what the director says the director made a shit movie he cannot be trusted I believe the the directors from either Brooklyn or the Bronx, but it, I just want to follow him around just for one day, and I think it'd be really fun. Hey, welcome to freaking Starbucks. What can I freaking get you? What can you freaking get me? You can freaking get me a freaking coffee. What, you busting my balls? Hey, buddy, I ain't busting your balls. Hey, fuck you, buddy. No, fuck you. And yeah. that's a typical, like, morning. <laughs> you know? And then you go to church, and it's like, hey, in the name of the frickin' Father, believe in the frickin' Lord. Fuck! So I imagine that that's just every day in Brooklyn. Uh, before we get to the monologue proper, I just want to say, uh, so a few episodes ago, we got ourselves our first real big time sponsor, uh, Sprite Soda. Yes. And Sprite said, uh, Sprite had us say some pretty crazy stuff. Yes. But uh, Sprite was very happy with our episode. And they said that they would talk to some of the other sodas out there. That dress is very pretty, Eleanor. I really like it. Can you use my what? My lipstick. Oh, I always want to. I don't have that much lipstick. Okay, so don't go overboard. Okay, yeah. here you go. There's my lipstick. Ugh, kids. So they went around and told uh, uh, some other sodas, and so now it, we've really hit the big time in terms of sponsorship. Yeah, we have hit the big time. The 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 Sprite episode was so big that I am happy to say that this week's episode of the Pope on Film is brought to you by Coca-Cola Bottling Company. Okay. Coca-Cola, drink up 
motherfuckers. I didn't want to say that, but Coke insisted that we say that. Yes. Just want to make that clear. I've got a bunch of things here that Coke wants us to say, and it's quite surprising. So here's another one. Ah, Coca-Cola no longer tastes like piss. That's another <laughs> one that they wanted us to say. Uh, oh, and here's one specifically for, for uh, in another language. Hey, you're freaking thirsty, get a freaking Coke. What are you talking about? Fuck you. That's specifically for New Yorkers. Yes. That is a oh, New I York prefer. commercial. I prefer, and I hate. I'm. I hate. I hope I'm not stepping on your toes, but you know, Coca Cola. Deny your creator. Nice. That's a good one. That's another good one. Thank you, Eleanor. Uh, you did pretty good with the lipstick. You did pretty good with the lipstick. I have seen you go very uh abstract with your lipstick. You 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 did it pretty good. Uh, buddy. All right, but yeah. it, it, come over here. Come over here and show everybody your lipstick. You, you did pretty good. You don't have to. You don't have to. You don't have to. In fact, I don't want you to. Don't you dare come over here. Don't you dare. What? Yeah. You want to show everybody your lipstick? I specifically told you not to. How dare you? <laughs> don't show everybody your beautiful lipstick. They'll go crazy. <laughs> there you go. There you go. That's called reverse pissachology. Yes. Bunny! Yes. I want to talk about us. I want to talk about you, uh, Bunford, Williamsburg, and me, uh, Malin, slash Reverend Steve. I, I feel that there's a big pressure. Since we're doing the show every other week, I sometimes feel that there's a pressure that we have to, t we have to open up the show talking about the news and current events and the big things that are happening, but every once in a while I'll realize, oh wait, this is our show, we can do whatever the hell we want. So, uh, let's talk about you and me. How many years have we known each other? Like, 11 years? 12 years? We've known each other yeah, for a... Since, well, longer than does that? Does, like, my space and shit like that really count? I don't, I don't think so. Like, we were Facebook friends on on Facebook for a while, but like we didn't really know each other. And well, we you didn't know each other really until we started the podcast. Yes, but like online, we knew each other for years. You had read my blog when I was still in California. That was like okay. So if we want to go there, that would be roughly around twenty uh, two thousand and seven. Wow, so like, like I was 14, sitting at 15 work, years. And I was bored. We got slow. We weren't getting calls, so I started Googling some things, and I came across the Church of Ed Wood. And I was like, this is fucking interesting. Okay. Read, the whole, thi read the whole thing through. Mm -hmm. Became a Woodian. Then started following your blog. Incredible. Incredible. So we've known each other for, for a, a good amount of time. You basically read my blog from start to finish. And Jesus, my freaking blog. Yes. I used to be just 100% honest on that damn blog. It was 100,000% my ugly, unfiltered life as a 20-year-old and a 30-year-old. And now as a 40-year-old. Yeah something parent of five that whole blog is just the most cringe thing that i've ever done <laughs> i have a detailed record of how much i was an asshole when i was younger and i know that i have a habit of making everything about the show i think you should leave with tim robinson the greatest tv show of all time and i apologize for that but i was a real piece of shit though Used to be. I said was. I'm not anymore. People can change. You changed, Eleanor? 
wow, in the six years you've been alive, you've really changed. You yeah. really changed. Because how? You used to not wear makeup. Yeah, now you wear makeup. Big change. People can change. Hey, Eleanor, same. I used to not wear makeup, and now I do. People can change. Yeah. The more you know. Do, 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 do. Uh, at the end of 2014, you came to me with an idea for a film podcast. That you had come up with a pretty easy, simple way to record a podcast. Uh, and you, you talked to me over the phone about doing a podcast together. And that was the first time we had ever spoken together. So if I'm not mistaken, our first episode of the podcast in 2014 was only like the second time we have ever spoken to each other. Uh, about that. And it's funny because when we were opening the show, I was actually thinking of that as well. Hmm. Because like, cause right from the very opening, like we talk a whole hell of a lot about literally what we were going to do except that we were going to be talking about the giant claw. So yeah. when we actually started, it was like, oh, fuck, I need to do some kind of introduction. Mm -hmm. And I did, welcome to the book club. I'm Bunny Williams, and with me is. And when I did that for the very first time, <laughs> there was a lot of dread that you would not know what I just did and be able to pick up. But thank God you did. Yay! <laughs> That's great. That's great. Now here we are doing episode 435, meaning in a very literal and real sense, there have been 434 episodes leading right up to this one, 100% correct. The math checks out. Don't question it. Yes. Why would you? This is episode 435, so there must be 434 episodes before this one. That's just common sense and math. Don't question it. Don't question it. Ah, so uh, I just had to explain that to Natasha. That's uh, hilarious. Um... But I appreciate you, Bunny. I appreciate you very much. We've known each other for like 15 years. We've been doing this podcast since 2014. This is episode 435. I I, I, I appreciate you so much, Bunny. Thank you. This show is, well. is just a, a bunch of fun. And I wanted to, to, to start this episode just talking about you and about us, because uh, this Monday will be my sixth week on um, estrogen and a testosterone yes. blocker. You need to tell that, me all about that. Yes, that is known as HRT, or hormone replacement therapy, for those of you not in the know. So I have a pill that I take once a day, pretty huge, and it blocks my uh, testosterone. And then I have the pill that uh, fills me with estrogen. And right now I'm on the lowest dose. Is it and I... flavored? No. The estrogen? No, but it is, it is a tiny little blue pill. Okay. And uh, so, so that's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, yeah mother's little helper and uh so it's been it it's it's you know one day shy of six weeks and i never thought i'd get here i have recently talked to my because i have a doctor and then i have a doctor uh i have like my gender doctor and I have recently talked on the phone with my gender doctor and my gender doctor says that uh everything looks good and she expects that in our after our next meeting which is in september she'll raise my dosage so i'll be getting uh, stronger doses of both my estrogen and my oh. testosterone blocker and so that's good right now i'm on the earliest dose but uh yeah things have been 
things have been good. It's difficult explaining to people because a lot of people go, oh, so how is it? How do you feel? And, you know, you said it. All of the things that my uh, HRT is giving me could easily just be I'm in my 40s. Okay. You know? So I've been really sore. My legs have hurt. My knees aren't the best. Uh, I'm, I get very tired in the middle of the day and want to just take a nap forever. I am very moody and um, I, not, not moody, but I'm very emotional. Very yeah. emotional. It, it's pretty easy to make me cry. And uh, thankfully, I was worried that it was going to be I'm super high manic. I'm super depressed. I want to kill myself. I'm crying all the time. Most of my emotions are focused solely on my wife. That like before I started taking the hormones. Oh, you know, honey, I love you. I love you so much. You're the best. But now I'm on estrogen and it's just. I love you so much. I, I love you. And so that's been difficult. I'm very tender and emotional towards the people that I love and care about. What did you say? You, you started saying something I feel like? You feel like what? You're going through puberty. Again. I'm going through puberty again. I'm going through puberty too. Yeah. That... Going through a puberty of a female is always different. And you are expressing to the world just exactly how teenagers might kill themselves if they're so in love. Yeah, yeah, I can. F I, yeah, Romeo and I get that Romeo and Juliet thing right now because the, it, I'm happy that so far my mood swings have been primarily focused on you, you know? Thanks. On you. I was worried that I was just going to be super, like, happy giggling and laying on the floor crying just 20 times a day. But no, it's all just, all of my emotions right now are just focused on you and how much I love you and how great you are. Big burden for me, but I'll do it for you. It's big bird for you? I didn't want you to find out. <laughs> Yeah, so so all, it, all of her emotions on Big Bird. No, she <laughs> said she said it's a big burden for me, oh, but I oh, okay. misheard her. I was just I was taking a piss. Uh, so so yeah, so that's been me. Oh, another I I want to eat constantly. So then I started getting anxious about that because I just want to eat twenty four seven. So I said, I'm going to start working out. I'm going to start doing walks and jogs and getting healthy and, and going outside and, and doing laps and feeling really good about myself. And I started doing like, hey, I did two miles of walking and jogging today. Hey, I did four miles. Hey, I did almost six and a half miles. Hey, I fractured my knee because I always overdo it. Now that I'm thinking about it, that really is tied to the to the estrogen because I I want to eat 24 seven. It's like a god. It, it, I'm like a food vampire Here's now. The thing. I don't know if it is tied to the estrogen because I would like to reference you back to California when we had a membership to California Family Fitness. California and Family you Fitness. It and had to have X-rays done of your chest and your ribs because you strained That's your ribs. That's right. I sprained my ribs because I was working out too much. You have a habit of doing this regardless do. of your gender. But this time I was specifically doing it because of the estrogen. But you can the do estrogen. it without overdoing. Yeah, yeah, and that's and that's, that's, that's what I'm. A that's you thing. Yeah, not a gender or estrogen thing. Yeah, but so. So yeah, we got a, a YMCA membership recently, and that's been great. We have it, it, there's a, a like an Olympic sized lap pool, and it's then a. Not very much bigger than that. No, really? Yeah. Wow, I know nothing. And else. then there's a, a lazy river and a water slide and a jacuzzi that's hardly hot. And there's what? 
slide. Yeah, and there's a water slide. Dinosaur. Oh, yes, and then the dinosaur water slide, the area for the kids. Yeah, I forgot about that. The With the buckets, water. yeah, and, and fountains. And so we've been going to that a lot. That's been fun. It has been fun. Uh, somebody does want to go there 24 7 and that's uh that's a bit difficult yeah it's closed because they had a swim meet and eleanor asked me mom can we go to the y i said why so we can go swimming okay but you can't go swimming the pool's closed show me prove it to me i'm like excuse you <laughs> like, that's i didn't market. know she said that that's funny yeah. <laughs> prove it to me i need proof so uh what was i saying so yeah so that's been me and my uh estrogen it's been great and i feel good my wife says that that my face has slowly been changing my face is the I it has i thought like in one picture and like one picture you sent up today i i i, I thought some of your facial features had looked more feminine but just yeah. the one so like i okay weird angle what i don't know yeah every every once in a while i'll get like a really good picture of myself it, it my cheeks are are getting a bit more sunken in yeah and i like that and my face is a lot smoother it hasn't stopped my facial hair from growing but it is growing a lot softer and and uh, shaving it is less of a pain, so that's good. And my yeah, baby definitely needs to wax again. Oh, need to wax Jesus again. Christ! And you then need, I, and then be tied down and waxed. That was the worst. And then I got uh, I it, Natasha ordered me some Nair hair remover specifically made for the face, and I tried some of that and i'm like oh hey you, i just have to put this on and wait 10 minutes and then you know uh dab it off with a wet cloth and there you go all the hair will be gone well apparently it doesn't work for me all it does is burn my face nice. yay hey didn't get that That's on why video you're supposed to do the skin patch test i guess i didn't do the skin patch test first i should have done that but uh so, yeah, so I'm very sad and happy and confident and depressed, and that can all happen in one afternoon. And I'm just fearing, feeling very emotional. And then on top of that, without getting into too, too much details, I've had a crazy-ass year. Yes, you have. Holy shit. I was at my absolute lowest point in the beginning of this year, but seriously, look at me now. I've lost almost 40 pounds. Yeah. Since December, I'm on estrogen and a testosterone blocker. My relationship with my wife is as strong as ever. We just had a date night last night that was really fun. I'm a proud trans woman, and I'm trying to be out in the open about that because there's a lot of people. One one thing that I, I didn't realize until I came out as a trans person is that uh, there are more people than you would imagine that are in the closet and can't come out are scared to come out or worried to come out or can't come out for one reason or another and i hear from so many of them who sort of uh are out vicariously through other people including me and and i'm, I'm just trying to be really out and open about you know being a trans woman during this political climate yeah. because I am in a unique position where I'm not going to lose my job. I'm my parents aren't going to stop talking to me. They already stopped talking to me when I was a dude. So uh, nothing's going to change now that I'm growing boobs. Uh, I'm not going to lose my wife. I'm not going to lose my kids. So it's like, then why why not why not just be out in the open about being a trans woman and and let people know about like, hey, this is how I got. On estrogen, this is what it's like to go to the movies. This is what it's like, and and I, I've been really proud of myself and proud of how far I've come this in less than a year. And I'm I'm feeling very nostalgic right now, probably because I I have so much uh, 
estrogen running through my body right now, but yeah. uh, I, I've been very nostalgic about about my life and my road, how I've my road to here, and I just wanted to 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 make sure that that you know that I love and appreciate you so much, buddy. Thank you. And this show is I love it, and it's great, and. Uh, I can't believe that the summer we spent watching movies on IMDb's bottom 100 was more fun than these COVID exploitation films. Yes, this but is, this, is this, a, is, this is a this is a worse rough ass summer. Summers. Yeah. Yes, I. What did you say? Yes. Eleanor thinks we're all gonna die together because we're all getting older. She said we may die. We may die together together. because we're all getting older. And then named off every individual in the house and said they're getting older. Mal's getting older. I'm getting older. Max is getting super older. I'm actually getting younger and hotter now that I'm on estrogen, which is. I'm just you know, we're all gonna die together because Eleanor doesn't understand age. Yes. Agreed. At, at six years old, it's difficult to. Uh... Yeah. But this has been a difficult summer. Yeah. This has been yeah. a difficult one. I I miss Saw. <laughs> True. Yes, we had we... we had more fun with Saw. Oh man, the great taste of Coca Cola. Drink Coke, you fucks. That's a they wanted us to say that as yes. part of the sponsorship. I didn't want to say that, but they wanted me to say that. So whatever. Drink Coke, you fucks. Uh, but I'd rather do the summer of COVID exploitation than have to finally uh, watch all of the damn Fast and the Furious movies. Gonna happen sooner or later. I know it's gonna happen sooner or later. I know it's gonna happen sooner or later, but I'm happy that we haven't done it yet. I don't want to watch those freaking movies at all. You, you've just known me for a very long time, and you know me very well, and we've been through a lot, and I wanted to just have like a Bunny and Steve uh, appreciation opening. So, so no news segment, no Vince McMahon bashing, although that is really fun right now. Yes. Uh, Vince McMahon is out as the CEO, and uh, Stephanie McMahon is now the co-CEO, along with the vice president, Nick Khan, who who has, or is it Tony Khan? It's one of the cons. Ten-minute warning. Ten-minute warning. Uh, and they made Triple H now the person in charge of creative, which means that a 76-year-old billionaire with numerous sexual harassment allegations is no longer writing the show. Which means it can only get better. Yes. It can only get better now that Vince McMahon isn't literally writing every second of the WWE. Um, Why does she have to be a co CEO? Why can't she I don't know that. I don't know. CEO because she's a girl. Because she has excellent question. And some titties. Fuck that. Fuck yeah. That. I've been wondering that myself. Uh. No ranting and raving about how Republicans are destroying this country in the opening, which they are. And the stupid shit that the Republicans do. Uh, small aside, uh, the vice president had a meeting with uh, disability advocates, a number of which were blind. And so she started a, a meeting saying who she was and her pronouns and describing her suit and Republicans being Republicans. I can't believe our idiotic vice president. Why would she have to describe her suit? She's talking to fucking deaf people. What? What? Fucking blind Blind, people, you you fucks. Like, damn. They don't. They don't care. Disabilities that have to be accommodated. And they have the money from all their fucking bullshit that they can uh, get private personal care to do. Fucking ridiculous. Does everybody have that access to money? Yeah. Absolutely ridiculous. 
But basically, this is a Bunny and Steve appreciation opening. I really appreciate you, Bunny, and I love doing this podcast with you. And if I didn't love the podcast, then I wouldn't be doing it anymore. Yes. Just period. But it's a whole lot of fun. And FYI, this has been a very sappy opening Act One monologue. And, and we've we, been, and we've been through a lot together. We have been. We've been, we've been, through, been through a, a lot, lot together. We've been through current obvious changes. Yes. And and a lot of things post Christmas. Yes. We we Behind have, the scenes. we have been through homelessness together. Mm-hmm. We have been through mental breakdowns together. And yeah. births of children. Yeah. Births of children. Several births. births. Yeah. Just one. I don't know why I'm trying to moralize. What? No, that's all right. We've we've been through a lot of horrible things together. Brats, Slender Man, Super Babies, Baby Geniuses 2, 2008's Disaster Movie. Yes. Recep Evadik. Recep Evadik. Just saying that, we get like a bump of like a thousand listens. It's incredible. This is becoming a reset Eva Deke Stan podcast. <laughs> but this is a really sappy intro. Uh, we're going to be taking a short break in a little bit, and then we're going to move on to Steve's historic approximations, where we are going to be... I'm going to get really pissed off. Yeah, okay. We're going to be talking about the difficult... Uh, the difficult position that liberals find themselves in now, where they kind of sort of have to defend the Walt Disney Corporation. <laughs> and that sucks. That really sucks. Having to defend this major corporation like they're not evil because the Republicans are convinced that they, they're eating babies. You know, so, but then the thing is, is that it, it, Republicans are out there saying, oh, Disney is groomers and they're uh, molesting children and eating children. And then the liberals are like, hey, calm down. Disney isn't doing that. And then, like, you eventually learn that in, like, 1945, Walt Disney made a cartoon called the joys of eating babies, and it's like, fuck, I'm trying to defend you! Yes. You're an no, evil I, corporation, I, I, and I'm having to defend you. I, I, I am in no mood to defend Disney. I really want to see Disney and Florida rip each other apart. So they are both just bloody masses. As long as Marvel movies survive. That's all I'm saying. And then I see, and then I see liberals. Oh well, if Ron DeSantis wants to uh, crack down on Disney, then Disney should just take their park and go somewhere else. Oh yeah, sure, just pack it all up in boxes. Just pack up the entirety of five theme parks, two water parks, and like thirty-five hotels in the back of a truck. Yes. Just drive it to another state. Easy as pie. Think, McFly. Think. <laughs> you know, I, I, I just get upset sometimes with liberals as much as I do with, with conservatives, but not in a Joe Rogan sort of of uh, way. A lot of times when you when you hear someone say, "Oh, I hate liberals and conservatives," and it's like, okay, only conservatives say that. But it, it, it upsets me because I remember when Trump was president, you'd see these pictures of Trump in the Oval Office being held by Jesus. Yeah. And there's an American flag in the back. And he's he's like glowing like he's a god. And all these liber liberals are like, oh, my God, this is horrible. And like half of those liberals are now showing pictures of the exact same thing with Biden. Although they they've got to do the Rambo Biden for me, those fucking I, pictures of Trump, I 
absolutely. Those are hilarious. Wrong. Yeah, it's like the one I found the other day where he was where Trump was riding a bear. Like, I yeah. fucking love that shit. And if they want to, do oh yeah, the guy Biden, who's the guy who's scared of my stairs. The guy who's scared of stairs is going to be yeah. riding a giant angry bear. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, no, no, no. I I mean, I don't know if we're exactly talking liberals though, or if we're just talking fucking Democrats. And and it pisses yeah. me off because like this is exactly what I said was gonna happen. Uh-huh. Biden's gonna get into office and everybody's gonna go to sleep. There's documented evidence out there that it and yep. here we go. All the shit that were angry at Trump about, which is correct because he was a piece of fucking shit. Yes. Biden gets a pass on that. Yeah. Biden gets a pass on the same fucking shit. Nobody gives a fuck about brown kids in cages anymore. Nope. And nothing, nothing has changed with that. There has not been a policy change. There has not been an executive order. There has not yeah, been anything nothing. at all. Nothing. But Democrats, it's okay, but it's cool Democrats, now because Biden's doing it. Yeah, because Biden's doing it. Yeah. I mean, Phony I guess, motherfucker. No, no, no. I read a headline about him completing, approving funds to complete Trump's wall. Yeah, yeah. And they're having a heyday with that because. Yeah. Instead of being like, oh, oh, he came to his senses, they're like, oh, <laughs> see, Trump was right. Yeah. It's like, no, it's no. It's ridiculous. Yeah. So I appreciate you, Bunny. I, I really you. appreciate I you. Appreciate Bunny you. and Steve. Bunny and May Lynn. Yes. Yeah. So I just wanted to let you know I really appreciate you. Oh. <laughs> hmm. So, uh, so that's it for our monologue. We are going to be taking a short break because Zoom only does 45 minute meetings, but we will be right back with Steve's historic approximations. We're going to be talking about the Disney Corporation and one of the weirdest, most horrible things that they've ever done. Our sponsor this week is Coca Cola. Drink Coke, you shitheads. We didn't want to say that. They made us say that. Yes. We had to. It's the copy right here. I got the paper right here. It's what they said. So uh, be sure and stay tuned because we will be right back with some more fun. It's going to cut off in five, four, three. It's- Certified frustration free packaging. Hmm. Not not frustrating. That's good. I guess I just pull here and uh Damn it. Damn it. Damn it. Can't okay. <laughs>
And we're back with more of the Pope on Film. Party! Yes. If you're like me, you're no doubt a big fan of this podcast, the Pope on Film. I mean, who isn't really nowadays? It's sweeping the nation. It's uh, roombaing the nation. But only the real fans, the true hardcore ride or die fans of this podcast only they would know the two basic undeniably really real and in no way made up on the spot facts about the both of us you and i america's cutest podcasting couple bunny and maylin uh now the first fact which is about you bunny yes is the fact that when you are not recording the podcast You are a celebrated chef. Not a lot of people know this about you. So tell us, Bunny, what makes you such a celebrated Michelin-rated chef? Well, first, uh, I slept with Aja Argento. Of Uh, course. So that was was a big leap in chefdom. Uh, And... What's really important, and uh, there are a few things that are important in being a successful chef, okay? You really need to have some sort of a niche to operate in, okay? So, you know, you got you, Emerald always had, had that bam, you know, and yeah. like just putting way too much garlic into shit, you know? Uh, yeah. Anthony Bourdain was professionally depressed, you know, things like that. Uh, Me, everything I make is either out of spam or roadkill. Nice. So that is the particular area, you know, like, like many, many dishes, you know, that starts with how poor people need to deal with leftovers you know the bread's going stale so let's make french toast you know and then normal household comfort foods become really really expensive over time and more and more foo-foo yeah okay so yeah. I am trying to elevate spam and roadkill or meat surprise because you meat never know surprise. when you got what you're going to find laying around yeah. uh, to a whole new level. Nice. Okay. I, I am mostly grinding them and then shaping them into interesting shapes. Yeah. Okay. So you can, you can eat a spam and roadkill gumby. Nice, you know, a, a, a grimace. Let you me know, ask you, a... Magilla Gorilla. Nice. Let me ask you a question. What's your chef catchphrase? Because every chef has the catchphrase, like you said. Uh, Emerald had bam. Anthony Bourdain yes. had. Oh, good grief. Yes. Um, my favorite was Mario Batali. His catchphrase was slap nuts. <laughs> and then he'd hit you with a guitar. That was weird. I, I go with this probably won't kill you. Nice. That's a good chef catchphrase. I like that. You know, so, so that- you, you, you're cooking... You know, and you reach over and maybe you're grabbing the chives. Maybe you're grabbing the comet. You don't know, but this probably won't kill you. Yeah, I I think that more uh, chefs should say that just, if anything, as a comfort, you know, just to make you feel a little bit better. And the second fact. Might not be bad for doctors either. Yeah, he, he, right. And the second fact about me is that I'm a, a lover of history. I love it. 
But I'm also a storyteller. So what we do at this section of the podcast is I take a story from the history books, maybe one that people don't know too well, and reword it via my own special, unique storytelling style. And that's what this is. Another educationally uneducational installment of Steve's Historic Approximations. Dun, 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 dun. Or Shap, as I like to call it, repeatedly, annoyingly, whether anyone wants me to or not. Now, personally, I like the name Shap. It's nice and easy. That's my style. Anywho, today on the old Shappity Shap Shap, we will be talking about one of the absolute craziest, most batshit insane things that the Walt Disney Company has ever done. And this is something that people here in America really have no clue that it even happened. This is a really good chap, and I really like it. Uh, and no, I am not talking about the one time when Disney tried to copyright a Mexican holiday. <laughs> but while we're on the subject, let's stop the chap for a wee bit, because I do want to talk about this. Okay, so there's a holiday. Dia de los Muertos. Yes. Or Day of the Dead. It's a holiday in Mexico that's dedicated to remembering people in your life that have died. Very Catholic, Latin American ritual thing. Latin American holiday. It's hard to explain to gringos like you, Bunny, you I've, white devil. I've seen Coco. <laughs> yeah. But in uh, Latino culture, death isn't entirely sad. And when you die, you're not just a rotting corpse. So, yeah. Anywho. Disney and Pixar started pre-production on their film Coco in 2011. And in 2013, the Disney Corporation said, uh, hey, let's copyright a Mexican fucking holiday so we can be the only one selling merchandise for it. So yeah, Disney tried to trademark Dia de los Muertos. This major corporation tried to copyright a holiday away from Mexico. What the fuck? Three caballeros my ass, Disney. Yeah. Fuck. <coughs> Have you ever been to Bahia? Have you ever been to Bahia, Bunny? I was explaining the three caballeros to Eleanor the other day, my six-year-old. And it, it's so difficult to explain that movie to someone who hasn't seen it. Okay, so Donald Duck has two cousins. One's from Brazil and one's from Mexico. Yeah. One of them is constantly smoking a cigar and the other one has guns that he's just randomly shooting in the air. He also has a magic carpet that flies. Uh, and for whatever reason, Donald wants nothing more than to get laid. With a with live action human women, yes, the weirdest freaking movie. Eleanor's like, I I can't believe that they made a Donald Duck movie for adults, and I'm like, no, 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 this is a kids film. It's the weirdest thing, and it's like, oh, let let's let me take you on a tour of Mexican culture, and by Mexican culture, I just mean I'm going to take you to cities and show you the dances they do. Because it's the 40s, and dances is all anyone knows. Let me teach you dances, and now let's try and get our beaks wet. Weird-ass movie. So, oh, fuck you, Disney. Fuck you, Disney. Um, this brings us to a very difficult position. We talked a little bit about it during the monologue in the beginning. But, uh, 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 so, Bunny and I are... In the words of someone who left us, who left us a scathing uh, Apple Podcast review, we are left-leaning trash. Yes. Uh, the Pope on film, left-leaning trash. Wink, wink noise. So all of us left-leaning trash out there are now in a position. Uh. Because the Walt, it, it, we're in a difficult position because the Walt Disney Corporation is just that a soulless, heartless, 
corporation with one purpose in mind, and that's to make as much money as they can off of people who, if they were on fire, the Disney executives wouldn't spit on them to put the fire out. That's, yes. you know, Disney is just a heartless conglomerate. You know, it's ah. it's horrible. But as a left leaning liberal, we all kind of have to defend Disney now. Because it's difficult because it's well, like, but, oh, but Disney, Disney is really like <clears throat> a microcosm of Hollywood itself. OK, yeah. when it comes to the money. When it comes to the business aspect of Disney making movies, anything like that, yes, evil fucking company. Yeah. It's an evil But when it comes down perfect. to the actual artists, that's where things get a little different. Yeah. But, you know, it's it's... It's difficult because, oh, uh, so uh, a liberal shows up and then a conservative comes up and they're both angry. They're both angry and they're both staring off a liberal and a conservative right next to each other. And the liberal looks at the conservative and says, what are you pissed off about? And the conservative says, I'm pissed off at the Walt Disney Corporation. And then the liberal says, I'm pissed off at the uh, Walt Disney Corporation, too. And the Repub the conservative says, yeah, I'm pissed off at them. Because they're an evil, heartless, soulless corporation that's just out there to make money. They keep raising the prices of their theme parks, making sure that nor normal, average, working class Joes like me can't afford to take their family there. It, 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 I, I hate the Disney Corporation. And the liberal goes, wow, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Wow, we have a lot of like, yeah, I hate that Disney Corporation. And also, they're turning all kids into pedophilic trans monsters. Probably because of, probably because of the, uh, the, the lizard people aliens that came here and started forcing people to eat babies in their underground caves of this flat earth. You know, and it's like, oh, yeah, I forgot. Uh, we seem to hate this company for different reasons. Yes. But we and all agree. Your one reasons thing. just drove off the fucking cliff. Yeah. Uh, so, OK. Uh, so here's the thing. Um, there, the brainwashed, angry, fake Christian right out there. Uh, are 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 convinced that Disney is full of groomers and that they're grooming kids. That that's uh that's what they say. Oh, they're groomers. They're grooming kids. It's part of a strategy that the Republicans do and they do really well where it's like what I am saying is right. Oh, you disagree with me? Okay. Child fucker. And and and, and that's it. Like there's no come back from that yeah just just what i'm saying is right and if you disagree with me okay then you're a satanic evil brainwashed agent of satan and you uh love grooming kids and eating kids and you're a liar and why are you in league with satan you grooming pedophilic child rapist and it's like okay we, fuck you it's difficult to to argue with that you know that like we're right anyone who is in is, is loves she loves to fuck kids that's basically what they're doing they have no proof of this but this is where uh this chap takes a bit of a difficult turn because uh no disney is not grooming kids but they did one time but not in the way that Republicans think they did. And that's what this chap is about. The one time that Disney, yeah, they were actually fucking grooming kids. But it has nothing to do with gay or trans people, okay? There's nothing to do with sex at all. Right. 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 I mean, I mean, like, like, a lot of what Disney does 
wouldn't you kind of consider it grooming? Like the whole Mickey Mouse Club, Britney Spears, for Christ's sakes. Yeah. Uh, Kurt Russell, Tommy Kirk. Tommy Kirk. Isn't, isn't that, I mean, they're grooming them to be Disney puppets, but it's, it's still like grooming. All I know is that the greatest Beach Boys song ever written is the theme song for the Annette Funicello movie, Monkey's Uncle. Yeah. The Annette Funicello Disney film, Monkey's Uncle, where Annette Funicello was backed up by the Beach Boys. Best Beach Boys song of all time, yeah. hands down. Um, I mean, they're grooming di- them to be, to be stars, but like stars consumers. in that Disney mold. Consumer groomers. Yeah. Consumer groomers. groomers. That's what Disney is. I believe that's just the basis for marketing. Yeah. We're all being groomed by marketing and by advertising and shit like that. You know? Yeah. So, I mean. But this is a difficult shap to do because if anyone says Disney and groomers in the same sentence, then odds are that person is an angry, bitter white Republican who just wants to go back to the good old days where they could be openly bigoted without fear of repercussions. Uh, fuck you. Disney isn't grooming kids for the gays. Disney, Disney is grooming kids for the money, but not for yes. gays and trans people. Yes. And, and uh, <coughs> entertainment <coughs> mirrors real life that's a fact here's another fact gay and trans people exist so disney simply showing two women in love and kissing or a trans man buying tampons that's not grooming it's just showing real life and gay people exist that's not grooming you fuck you know well it is because it's not the christian way so anything that goes against my Bible and my belief that my pastor forces down my throat every day with his fucked up rhetoric, you know. Yeah. Evil. Um, But Disney did groom kids once, and that's what this story is about. It No, it did not happen in America, and no, it has nothing to do with gay people and trans people. And just to be clear, if any Republicans are watching, number one, hi, what the, what are you? How in the world did you get here? Are Number you two, lost? <laughs> yeah. Do you need help, Grandpa? Number two, fuck you. And number three, uh, the only reason you hate trans people so much right now is because it's an election year and the GOP couldn't find a caravan of illegals to blame everything on. Yeah. Just to be clear. Uh, uh, so the rich white politicians that have brainwashed you went with trans people this time around. Uh, uh, F you for real. Anyway, Disney. Okay, so here's the chat. Uh, Disney's making a bunch of money with the theme parks. There's Disneyland. There's Disney World. Disney World is created in such a way where you are at the park. Okay, you want to get some food? You want to spend some money doing some things? Okay, well, here is this big, massive complex that is difficult to get out of. The the thing that I love about Disneyland is, you know, Natasha and I would go to Disney. Tom and I would go to Disney, and we'd spend the day there, and it's like, oh, we want to get food. Okay, well, we can spend a ridiculous amount here at Disneyland and get food. Or we just cross that street right there, and there's a fucking McDonald's. Nice. Just cross that street, literally five minutes away from the entrance. There's a freaking McDonald's. You can just go there or down there is a Denny's. Uh, It's still a a bit expensive, but not as expensive as like 95% of the restaurants at fucking Disneyland, you know? So it's like, just go there, just get food. Disney World is set up in such a way where it's like, hey, you're in this park. Are you hungry? Now we've got you right where we want you. Because It'll be like 20 minutes drive just to get out of this park to get cheap food somewhere else. So uh, it, it, the theme parks were a moneymaker. So 
they were it, a, a cash cow. You've got Disneyland and then Disney World, and they keep adding more parks to Disney World and more uh, hotels and stuff like that that they own, and it's this big, massive thing. And then they did Euro Disney, which was a failure in the beginning, but it, it, it's still there, and it it it, it eventually you know, did become like a, a cash cow for them. And they did a Tokyo Disneyland, which was another bit of a hit. And so they, they were like, where can we open our next Disney theme park? And that's when they focused on the big cash cow, China. Because how many people are in China? Like a tragillion yeah. people? in china and so it, over the last few decades not just america but so many other countries are like well china is a communist country and uh they don't really have like a free press and the government controls what is being taught and uh the people are really oppressed but if we treat them nicely, they will give us money. Yes. So, and, and and it's really difficult, and especially here in America. And so Disney is like, okay, I've got an idea. This is crazy. But hear me out. Shanghai Disney. We tap into that Chinese market. So they do tests. And, and uh, there's a problem with opening up Shanghai Disney. and. It's the fact that this isn't a, a Western country. It, it's a, a communist country, and it's un, under very strict rule. And they have rules about what content can come into the country and what content can come out of the country. And so the children in China, they were not raised on Disney. Oh. Like I swear, I, when L when Maxwell was born, I don't know when it happened, but he just was born knowing Mickey, Donald, Minnie, Goofy, Pluto. He he was just it, yes. just, it was just in his brain, you know, because because the Disney brand is sort of everywhere, especially for young children that you're it, here. You're just sort of born with those characters. But in China, you, like you show them a picture of Goofy, they won't know what the hell that is. Like, what is this? I don't know Tron. And it was like years, years as a kid. I remember knowing Mickey Mouse and knowing Donald Duck and and like never actually seeing them in a cartoon. Yeah. Yeah. They were just sort of everywhere. They were just yeah. sort of all over the place. Yeah. So it's like, okay, so we can't, if we open Shanghai Disney, that would make a ton of money. But first, we have to teach Chinese people about Disney. It's like, okay, well, let's just open up a uh, Disney channel in China. Well, they control the TV. They control the media. They control what you see. You can't just open up a cable channel in China. So they're trying to figure out a way around it. The government won't allow the Disney Channel. They won't allow American movies. If we opened a theme park in China, that would be huge. But how do we get people to know the brand? In 2008, they found the way. And it's really fucked up. Okay. It is really fucked up. In 2008, in China, Disney started opening schools. Okay. They were known as Disney English. Okay. Schools in uh, whose main intention was teaching children how to speak English. And that was big money in, uh, in like, 2005? In, in 2008? 
uh, schools were big money, uh, it was a billion dollar market in China. Learning, it, it, opening up a school that taught people how to speak English was a billion dollar industry in China. If you wanted to make some quick, easy money, you just had to open up a school and start teaching English. It was gangbusters. And so, oh, Disney is coming into China as it, 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 in the spirit of uh, goodwill and friendship to teach our brothers and sisters in, in the East the language of English. There's no ulterior motive here. We're just trying to help you people out. If you want to learn English, hey, we'll get the best teachers from all over America to come here and to teach you English. Here, we have this, this uh, textbook right here. Why don't you read uh, this textbook? Here, here is a math problem to help you learn English. Luke Skywalker has five apples. Minnie Mouse has 10 apples, and they use these English schools to get in at a very young age with children to teach them about their Disney characters. They That's were so grooming kids. Up. It is really fucked up. Here, I've, I, I got a, a couple of articles. Uh... Disney basically said, well, okay, we don't have decades of movies to do this with, and they weren't allowed by the Chinese government to get a Disney Channel onto Chinese airwaves. So what they decided to do was launch a string of schools called Disney English, which would teach young Chinese children English using Disney characters. Uh, Mickey wants an apple. Luke Skywalker is 30 years old. I walked by one of these schools when I was there, and I remember that Toy Story 4 was coming out that week, and all of the teachers were wearing Toy Story 4 t-shirts. So it was a school that doubled as a really effective marketing tool, marketing towards kids. Not only did they learn English that their parents wanted them to speak, but they left with an affection for these Disney characters that they had been introduced to, which led to the very successful opening of Shanghai Disney in 2010. At one point, they were hoping to open uh, 250 Disney English uh, schools throughout china isn't that insane it is fucked up too they were actually grooming kids yeah in china it had nothing to do with gays it had to do with uh branding here's another article i found uh, uh disney is starting years earlier brainwashing chinese children and cultivating them as potential clients in a very indirect yet penetrating <laughs> fashion. What Disney is doing now in China is growing a future consumer base. Being surrounded by Disney products and characters, it's impossible for parents and their children in China not to love Disney. And that preceded the development of the Shanghai Disney Park. They wanted to open a Disney wanted to open a theme park to make money. They realized that the the country didn't know Disney. So they opened up schools for the specific purpose of brainwashing children and parents into liking their corporation. Yeah. That sounds really fucked up. It is fucked up. And I'm I'm also I'm also really thinking like like okay okay, you want to what you want to you want to start a a Disney Channel here? No, no, we just can't let you do. Hey, how about a school? <laughs> That is so weird. You, you, you think maybe you could do a school? <laughs> That's so weird. And I don't think a lot of people know this, but this is a thing. It, it happened. It's a fact. Disney opened a series of schools. That's creepy. That's the future that Republicans want. And it would either work or fail miserably. Depending on the kids. Yeah, and it succeeded. And warning. It succeeded in the in the sense that they were able to open Shanghai Disney. It was really popular because of their chain of uh, indoctrinating schools around China. 
and they made a ton of money. And to show how unserious they were in uh, 2020 because of the pandemic, or was it 2021, 2020 or 2021? Sometime during the pandemic, they shut down all of the schools. Oh. They were like, uh, coronavirus, can't do it anymore. Still, have fun at Shanghai Disney. Bye. <laughs> so they used uh, uh, English language schools in order to sneakily gain a foothold into the country. That is really fucked up. That is. And you could see how it works. I mean, if you're, if yeah. you're inundated with Disney characters just all day, all through a school day? Yeah. That's fucked up. It is. It is messed up, and it, it, liberals are in this difficult position where it's like, oh man, this Lightyear movie, it looks dumb. I don't want to go see that. Oh, what? Uh, two gay women kiss in it, and now Republicans are boycotting the movie? Well, shit, I guess I gotta fucking spend money on Lightyear now. <laughs> Thanks. I gotta go watch this hour and 50 minute it was I not. Know. It wasn't See, a good movie. I, I, I good don't. Movie. I don't play that. Lightyear was a stupid fucking idea from the beginning. It was. So what? It, it it doesn't make it better or worse or anything that there's a brief lesbian kiss in it. It's just yeah. really annoying that. That uh. Like they'll hate something, but it's like Christ, can you can you hate it for the right reason? Yeah. Like can't it just be a shitty movie? Yeah, and then Lightyear bombed and Republicans are like, ah, get woke, go broke. That's what you get for forcing your woke ideologies onto you. And it's like, no, Lightyear didn't fail because oh, uh the people who hate cancel culture tried to are trying to cancel Disney. It didn't succeed because the movie just sucked yeah it just it was a stupid concept yeah ridiculous you know i mean uh yeah so that's shap this week disney was grooming it had nothing to do with gays or trans people i can't wait for it to not be an election year they could have had a light year universe all of its own but they step too far yeah you know okay so buzz lightyear is now a real spaceman flying around so how does andy know about this spaceman flying around that he wants its toy and how do the toy manufacturers know to make a toy about this spaceman? Because it explains it in a in a little uh, opening bit of text in the beginning of the movie that the movie Lightyear is actually a movie that came out in the 90s that a young Andy saw and then went to the store to buy the toy loosely based on the movie. And it's like, why do you have such a convoluted plot for yeah. cartoons about toys? I mean, they could have made it about a movie. I mean, that would be fair. You would know from the marketing, but like, don't just give us the movie. Show us you making that movie. Show it, you know. Show, yeah. show it. Show. And that's why I say a universe, because we could have. Buzz Lightyear there. We could have Buzz Lightyear the TV show. We could have Bud Lightyear, uh, Buzz Lightyear the radio show, because we don't know how far back he goes as a character. You accidentally said Bud Lightyear, and I want to take just a second of time before we get cut off by Zoom to talk about uh, Rick and Morty's dominance in the world of uh, marijuana paraphernalia. 
Okay. A lot of bongs, a lot of... Uh, so I was trying to think, what other animated characters could replace Rick and Morty as good things to see on, like, bongs and and uh, pipes and stuff like that? So I was trying to think of, like, okay, other than Rick and Morty, what other cartoons could you get to be on weed stuff? And the only one that I could think of that I think is perfect, Garfield. Garfield. Because he's lazy. All he all he wants to do is like sleep and he has the munchies all the time. Like it makes sense. Yes. If I was gonna get like a bong and there was a bong with Rick and Morty on it, and there was a bong with fucking Garfield, I'd buy ten of those. <laughs> And the Rick and Morty bongs that you're selling are already like a like a illegal bootleg Rick and Morty bongs. Fuck it, start putting Garfield on there. Yeah. Shit, I'd buy the hell out of that. Yeah. We definitely a... have to go with the with the uh Bloom County characters. Oh, that's another good one. They need to be yeah, on Build the Cat. Yes. Oh man, that's such a good idea. Bill the Cat oh. was made for a bong. I want a bong and it just says cow tools on it. Yes. That's what I want. Cow tools. Man. That's another good one. Kathy. I just want Kathy. I, yes. No, Ziggy. I want, a, I want Ziggy pipes. Ziggy. Z Ziggy. Ziggy uh, uh, rolling uh, plates. He's you know? he's pretty much been forgotten by history. He has. He has. Ziggy, a... It's weird because Ziggy in that second was all over the fucking place. Everywhere. Everywhere. He had a Christmas special. Cups and calendars and placemats and notebooks and trapper yeah. keepers. You can get fucking D Ziggy on goddamn anything. Yeah, that was back when comic strips had merchandise. Yes, I remember seeing Bill the Cat dolls. I didn't have a Bill the Cat doll, but I did have an Opus doll. But I really think that Ziggy is the last performer to have died because of the talkie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because he was yeah. this completely silent character. Yeah, he had a Christmas special where he didn't say a single word. And then he was fucking gone. Yeah. No, Bunny. Ziggy was taken to a nice farm upstate <laughs> where there were a bunch of other Ziggies there and he can just run and play. It's fun. Uh, it Ziggy is there along with uh, the cast of BC and the Wizard of Id. Yes. They're all there. Beetle Bailey is there. <laughs> Snuffy uh, Smith. Snuffy Smith. Yeah. So much fun. So that's it for this week's Steve Historical Approximations. Be sure and join us next week for more educationally uneducational fun with Steve's Historic Approximations. And cut on that. Bunny, unfortunately, we have a movie to get to. Yes, uh, we do. 2021's The COVID Killer. Um, no, I don't want to see your fucking shoe collection. <laughs> Fuck, this is a New York movie. Fuck! <laughs> How many times do we have to see your nice, expensive car? Fuck you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> We need to talk about this week's movie, The COVID Killer. Um, but we are going to take a break. We're going to be watching some videos and uh, maybe, if we're lucky, a song or two. It's going to be a whole bunch of fun. And uh, so stick around. You're going to want to hear about this week's movie. And we're going to be talking about the filmmaker. There we go.
is class foil more than in the in the past 25 years than in the entire recorded history. Republicans had cause to laugh today, and no, I'm not talking about Trump care. They're fine with that. The book, Reasons to Vote for Democrats, a comprehensive guide, released on February 8, 2017 and written by Michael J. Knowles, became Amazon's number one bestseller. The book, which contains 266 blank pages, has a loyal fan base who were more than happy to leave a review singing its praise. While many found the book informative, captivating, and the best book they have seen this year, others found that the 266 blank pages actually gave them nightmares. Some purchasers of the book found the blank pages too daunting and are anxiously awaiting the audio version. The GOP base, who vigilantly scrutinizes any and all events for even the slightest hint of conspiracy, concocted this very plausible scenario. Quote, I totally called that Dems would copy this idea and call it their own. Remember kids, if they didn't have double standards, they wouldn't have standards at all. Unquote. In fact, this has already happened when liberal trolls released this book two months earlier. Why Trump Deserves Trust, Respect, and Admiration, written by David King, contains 206 blank pages. TPOF analyst Floyd Likes the Cox notes that it took Michael J. Knowles two months to plagiarize a blank book. While many agree with Mr. Likes the Cox, critics are quick to point out that blank novelty books have been a staple of the publishing and novelty industry for many years. They believe that this may indicate that the plagiarism could potentially go back much, much further. Those who are aware of the book Why Trump Deserves Trust, Respect, and Admiration repeatedly point out that that book never made the number one spot on Amazon's bestseller list. Research conducted by Satoshi Kanazawa of the London School for Economics and Political Science seems to indicate that Democrats prefer books that actually have words in them.
I was worried about your voice there. Yowza. Uh, okay. Uh, it's time, Bunny! It is time. Yes, Bunny, my friend, who is more than brother to me, I embrace thee. That's a reference to a specific uh, Thor cartoon. <laughs> it is time, because when I, w I was born at the tail end of the 70s, I was raised in the 80s, but I would go to Lionel's Play World, which was Toys R Us before Toys R Us was Toys R Us. Yeah. And there, they would sell VHS uh, m tapes of Marvel cartoons for $5, and you would get one cartoon from the 80s, and one on each videotape was one cartoon from the 80s and one cartoon from the 60s. Oh. Amen. And that was, so that's when I saw a lot of those old, almost clutch cargo looking cartoons from like the 60s where they would yeah. just get Jack Kirby panels and they'd blow them up and they'd animate them very crudely. And there was a specific one that I would watch over and over again where Hercules comes down from Asgard to fight Thor, but he meets Jane Foster and they start dating because Jane Foster is angry because Thor had to go to Asgard <coughs> and starts dating Hercules instead. So the two of them have a big fight, which is why at the end of Thor Love and Thunder, I got all giddy. Yeah. He even had the little weirdo scepter thing and like the little hat. It looked like a really good Hercules, but anyway. Uh, uh, yeah, see, I. I... I hit just right for those cartoons. Yeah. I was I was born in 63. So spent a chunk of my childhood the part that I'm not too terribly aware of, you know? Yep. And then like that show it had its run and then it was in rerun somewhere. And that's where I saw it and I and that's where I found out about like Captain America and Iron Man, and you know there was also the separate Spider Spider Man cartoon and the separate Fantastic Four cartoon, all yep. at the same time. And people <laughs> people nowadays can just go into spins a web any size, catches thieves just like flies. But you don't see a lot of people singing. When Captain America throws his, his mighty, mighty shield, shield. You know, all you don't those see who chose to oppose his shield must yield. Me. When it comes to a fight, and it's... I'm, I'm fuzzy here, man. With the red and the white, the white and the blue. blue. When Captain America throws his The red and the white and the blue come through shield. when Captain America throws his mighty shield. Yeah. You don't see a lot of people. And then, like, Iron Man had like a swinging yeah. 60s one. Doc Bruce Iron Banner, Man. belted Iron by Man. gamma rays, turned yep. into the Hulk. In the army, will they ever love an Hulk? Hulk. And then Hulk. there was another, like the Captain America one, there was a. From the Rainbow Bridge of Asgard. Asgard. Yeah. So I would watch those cartoons, you know, from those VHS tapes that, that were just five bucks at Lionel Play World. We are having this conversation and it's a lot of fun because talking about the 1960s Marvel cartoons is more fun than talking about this week's film, The COVID Killer. Yes, a movie okay. that pisses me off right from the cover. OK, <laughs> right from the fucking poster, it pisses me off. I'm Why? going back. To, I'm going back to the pre-roll real quick here. I mean, yeah, okay. You and I could go as the COVID killers for Halloween. That'd be a fucked up cosplay. <laughs> yeah, I'd be the COVID killer and you'd be the COVID copycat killer <laughs> with your hammer that makes like cartoon sound effects when you hit people. Yes. 
<laughs> the COVID killer. Yes, Bunny, my friend, who is more than brother to me, I embrace thee. It is time once again for all of us here at the Pope on Film Podcast to Macarena our way into the second half of the show. And it is said second half, wherein we finally and eventually get around to discussing our all-new premium direct from the Fresh Mountain Strings right to you, Movie of the Week! And this week, we continue our summer-long look at COVID exploitation films of verbal copyright 2022, the Pope on Film podcast, and Reverend Steve, with a look at a COVID slasher called The COVID Killer. And before we continue with the podcast, oh my God, I have some breaking news, Bunny. Okay. Some breaking news. Hot off the presses. Get ready. Hold on to your hat. <laughs> Prepare your bowels for imminent release. Because I've got an article here, and this is going to blow your mind. I'm going to read it verbatim. Okay. Absolutely. Positively. 100% verbatim as it has been written here. Not going to skip anything. It's from the website brunomars.us. And even though it's a .us, something tells me this might not have come from America. Don't ask me how I know that. But, yes. here's, the, but here's the headline. Boyfriend of Madonna, who is the new one? So let me read this uh, huge news story for you. The ex-wife of Sean Penn and Guy Ritchie have found a replacement Brahim Zabat. The love story that has been built up over the three years, she has run aground and replacement. Who is boyfriend of Madonna? <laughs> the singer of the song Hung Up is once again are making love with a man younger. Who is boyfriend of Madonna? Uh -huh. A dancer and choreographer, 26-year-old, became Madonna's date. He is Timor Steffens, dancer ever accompanied Beyonce in Grammy Award 2010. Okay, okay. But what if evidence? If we have they... anybody listening who does rap music or electro or something like that, that shit right there needs to be fucking sampled. Yeah, it's pretty great. It's pretty great. I... What evidence they dating? Caught on camera during a date in New York City on Broadway, Madonna knows man with a six-pack of 2010 at the Chateau. Wow, that's big news there. This has to be written by the same person who, who, uh, who wrote Does Bruno Mars. Does Bruno Mars is gay, yeah, it's the same. Unlike when Brahim Zabat dating Madonna, who at the time Madonna ever admit that Brahim is his fiancé, a source said that Madonna is not as serious as previously in this men he knew in Switzerland. One year older than Brahim Zabad, Timur Stefan's boyfriend of Madonna looks not much older than Brahim. Is this time a serious relationship or just having fun, right? Is this boyfriend of Madonna the last for her? Is he managed relationships with the Ainge Rage, which is too far? Let time answer. Hoping this beautiful woman's 56-year-old soon found a suitable partner for him. Wow, that's a huge news story. Why isn't the liberal media reporting this? Yes. Who is boyfriend of Madonna? He is Timur Stephens. Who is, uh, who is of the age range, which is too far. Man. What I, about the uh, liberal left-wing media? I actually feel... This makes me happy. This makes me happy, okay? Because... I'm glad that the Google AI has stepped out and started a blog. <laughs> Who is a, boyfriend a of Madonna? Celebrity gossip blog. But I'm not here to question what Google, the Google AI, may be into. Yeah, you know, yeah. but. But everyone's asking. She, you know, I was really Madonna? kind of down for destroying the planet. So, so celebrity blog is kind of a comfort. Yeah. You know? Who is boyfriend of Madonna? 
I think Google AI needs to be encouraged in their endeavors in the I'm world of it. celebrity gossip. Yeah, I love that. That's great stuff. I'm going to read more from that website. There's a bunch more articles. That website is famous because of an article on there with one of the best written articles of all time. It has. It also has the greatest headline. Does Bruno Mars is gay? <laughs> it's it's wow it's a masterpiece yes it is a masterpiece article so who is boyfriend of madonna so okay so it's uh summer time uh you got women you got women on your mind and really if her dad's rich take her out for a meal but if her daddy's poor and here's the important thing. Just do what you feel. You can rape her behind the dumpster. Just do what you feel. Yeah. Just do what you feel. Uh, I think it's hilarious that Mungo Jerry... Number one, their name is so different after you've seen Cats four times in theaters. Yes. Which I'm not only proud about, but I'm also smug about it. Number two... Uh, um. I love the fact that the band Mungo Jerry was mentioned in Avengers Endgame, which means that, you know, it's canon in the MCU. Yes. And I like that. And that Shirley from Community said it in an elevator. I also <laughs> like that. Okay, so it's summer, and uh, we do themed summers here at the Pope on Film Podcast, and this summer we're looking at COVID exploitation films. Uh, cheap Films that were quickly made to cash in on a deadly pandemic that has killed millions. And this week, it's the 2021 film The COVID Killer, which currently has a 1.6 out of 10 on IMDb, which I personally think is way too generous. Yes, it is. Uh, I'm going to try and stay uh, focused here. We've already had long discussions about uh, 1960s Marvel cartoons. And uh, who is Madonna boyfriend? Because any other thing is more fun to talk about than this movie. Yes. Because uh, this movie sucks ass. But uh, so I'm going to try and not go on tangents anymore. But there is something I wanted to mention. So, Bunny, there's a review of the COVID killer on IMDb that I wanted to mention. This one is from IMDb user Warehouse Reviews. Thank you, Warehouse Reviews. And it says, actually getting COVID is better than this movie. Bunny, your thoughts? Uh, I, I, I think it would be more fun. I think it would be more fun than, than having to watch this movie. I think Biden just got COVID for the second time. They called uh, it a I think he thought he had it. He didn't have it. Who the fuck knows? Who the fuck cares? Yeah. At, 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 it's kind of sad to think that at this point, I'm proud that I haven't gotten COVID twice. Yes. Amber's gotten it three times. Oh. My daughter, Amber, has gotten it three times. And and there's seven of us living in a very small house. So the fact that I've only gotten it once, that's, uh, you know, self high five right there. Uh, the first time she got it, I was sharing a room with her and I didn't get it from her. Good for you, Mal. Two of the three times that Amber has gotten COVID, um, Mal was sharing a room with Amber and yet, Mal has also only gotten it once. All right. That is impressive. That is really impressive. First time around, made them sit on the, live on the couch with a mask. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. So the thing that upsets me about this movie is, is that at its most basic, the plot is at least intriguing. I do like the idea of there's a serial killer out there killing people. But how do you catch someone when everyone's wearing a mask? That is an interesting premise. 
And I, I could see myself watching an interesting Law and Order episode about that. You know? It must be difficult when everyone's wearing masks, like yeah. in the middle of the pandemic, to catch a serial killer. Okay, I, I get that. that. That is an interesting premise. Uh, unfortunately, the director of this is a man named Jeff Knight. And, um, okay, so this is the story of his second film. And I think it says a lot about the director of The COVID Killer. Uh, the guy's name is Jeff Knight, and his first film, he did a couple of short films, and then his first feature-length film was a movie called American Pirates. And he was looking for interesting ways in New York to advertise it, and apparently the Howard Stern Show contacted Jeff Knight and said, Hey, Jeff Knight, if you put Jeff the Drunk, one of uh, Howard Stern's uh, weirdos that he... Uh, manipulates uh for for listens for listeners um <laughs> if you put jeff the drunk in your movie we will let you advertise the movie on the howard stern show so in his first film american pirates it was very difficult because jeff the drunk a uh, spoiler alert he's a drunk uh jeff knight k-n-i-t-e which i hate i hate that Jeff Kennedy. Jeff Kennedy did get Jeff the Drunk to be in American Pirates. And then Howard Stern reneged on his deal and wouldn't allow Jeff Kennedy to advertise American Pirates on the Howard Stern show. So he went through this long, arduous process of trying to get on the Howard Stern show, which he turned into his second film a documentary called Searching for Howard, uh, Waiting for Howard Stern. Okay. And you see a second of it uh, in this week's movie, his third full-length film, The COVID Killer. And just the fact that this guy is struggling to get on the Howard Stern show, I think tells you everything you need to know about this director. Yes. Not the highest of high brows. <laughs> I think is what we're saying. But if I could just go on a small tangent, I can't believe that Howard Stern has gone the way of I'm Bart Simpson, who the hell are you? And uh, oh my God, they killed Kenny. And Beavis and Butthead saying the word fire. That Howard Stern is now the person who all of America hated and that parents said was ruining society and that uh, people protested, but now you see interviewed on CNN. Yes. Like, when did that happen? When did suddenly a big news story is about what Howard Stern said about Donald Trump? I don't care about either of those people. No. Because it's not 1993 anymore. <laughs> who care about Howard Stern fuck and it's like I grew up can, can I believe Howard Stern I mean like I, suddenly I, Howard it Stern. might be fun but who cares I don't even know if it's trustworthy suddenly Howard Stern is like res respected the fuck did that happen this is me off. Anyway, fucking this movie. Okay, this movie. This movie. What is it? Uh, what is this movie, Bonnie? It's kind of, sort of, well, first off, what it is, is at least 50 fucking percent stock footage. Oh my god, even Ed Wood would be like, I think you've used too much New York City stock footage. And like, even Ed Wood even, would be like, back it up on the stock footage, buddy. Not even stock footage, like shit that he's lifted off of YouTube that you. No way did a. Uh, fucking what's his name? Farrell, the talk show guy. Jimmy Fallon. Jimmy Fallon. Who the fuck way did Jimmy Fallon sign off to be in this fucking movie? 
the COVID that did killers. not happen. The Young Turks yeah. did not sign off to be in this fucking movie. Yep, yeah, the Young a Turks. A lot of the of the news footage. He did not have permission. Yep, and he's altering them to make it look like it's all coming from some local station. Yeah, and he crops it badly. He crops it all pretty freaking horribly. So Dude. that's it. That's that's one half of the movie. Yeah. Okay, is various people, Trump, Fauci, whoever, talking about coronavirus. I don't think I have said this on the podcast since we did that pretty horrible remake modern day remake of plan nine but the best part was the naked chick with the big ass yeah <laughs> i haven't said that since we saw uh mr lobo's uh star making vehicle yes plan nine way to not give me a call but that's beside the point i've moved on <laughs> that. uh, that's definitely not an engram yes this movie wants to be so much, but at the end of the day, it just reeks of a group of friends making a quick buck by making movies that they aren't talented enough to actually make. Yes. And I think I've said this multiple times during our summer of COVID exploitation films, but the best part of this movie is when the credits are done, there's only 79 minutes left. Yes. So that's. Oh my God. And the fucking, the f- fucking ending credits. First off, the ending credits were like 10 minutes long at least. Because he's putting bloopers in between the credits. He In the hopes that you don't balls. notice the I fact that sorry. only like three people what made this. balls to put blooper reels at the end of this piece of shit. You can see the best. You ain't no fucking Jackie Chan. You ain't yes. no. You, you ain't. Yeah, you ain't no Burt fucking Reynolds, okay? Exactly. Exactly. I was about to say, the only time that end credit should have a blooper reel is, number one, if you're watching a Pixar movie, they don't even do that anymore, and it pisses me off. Uh, if it's a Burt Reynolds movie, or if Jackie Chan breaks something. Yeah. If Jackie Chan hasn't broken anything, I don't want to see the bloopers. That being said, uh, Everything Everywhere All at Once is one of my favorite movies. Yes. Definitely the number one movie of the year so far. Uh, I, I, have real, I have real high hopes for that movie, uh, A Thousand Years of Longing, that's going to be coming out soon. Uh, oh, and also, uh, there's a preview out. In September, we're already getting a prequel to X. Yeah? Yeah, because they made X and they made the prequel back-to-back. So the movie X came out, uh, A24's uh, 70s porn version of uh, a Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And now, six months later in September, we're getting a prequel. They've already made it. It's already ready to go. I'm really excited about that. They specifically want, they specifically pitched the idea of the movie X as being the start of an artistic avant garde A24 successful horror franchise. And I really like the concept of that that, like, oh, A24 will have its own high class saw. That's kind of awesome. I'm I'm really excited about it. Anyway, uh, this weekend they re-released everything, everywhere, all at once in theaters. So last night, my wife and I went to go see it in theaters, and they had a really sweet, funny introduction by the two filmmakers. And then at the end, they showed eight minutes of bloopers. Yeah, and it was hilarious. It was, oh, I love that movie so much. Everything, everywhere, all at once. It was so good. And I brought a googly eye to put on my forehead. Yeah. And I was really proud of that. There were only like eight other people in the theater. It was really nice. Uh, Love that film. Okay. uh, Focus. 
focus. This movie well, sucks so much. There's not much to focus on. Uh, there's a so lot got, more to focus on. We got on. half stock footage. Half, and then I a swear. And a 10-minute credit sequence of bloopers. That's yeah. not a whole hell of a lot movie left. No. Of which it was trying to be a police procedural slash slasher film. The worst fucking police. Yeah. In the freaking world. Low budget as shit. Porn has better quality than this film. Yes. 90s pornography has better quality than this film. Jenna Jameson was a better actor than all of the people in this film. (laughs) And that says a lot. That's harsh. Like, uh, what's his name? He's in jail now for like an entire, for like decades of rape, but Ron Jeremy would have been a better actor. Yeah. Than any of the people in this. This movie sucks. No one here is an actual actor. Apparently the director has never heard of lighting or sound. No. Because I swear to God, I that the lighting of this film was literally just turning on a lamp, and that's it. So there's a Spanish guy slashing people only from the left. Yes. Oh, I've got it written down. Here are the three things we know about the COVID killer. He only kills women. He only slashes from the left. And every woman that has so far been killed has had sex with one asshole police officer immediately before they died. But we won't do shit about that last fact because because ACAB. And like a- huh? ACAB stands for All Cops Are Big Shoe Collectors. Yes. That's what ACAB stands for. And it was an impressive shoe collection, I guess, if you're into that sort of thing. You know, I mean... This movie (sighs) is a movie made by Maxim Magazine fans for Maxim Magazine fans. And since they spent no money on anything, I can only guess that that is just that guy's big ass fucking shoe collection. Yep. 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 You know, I mean, this is a movie that played a hospital scene on the living room couch. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, I don't think they bought shelving. And a whole lot of shoes to get this shot. One of these motherfuckers just had all of those shoes. And I really think that they were just going to make a film about the COVID killer. And then they thought, oh shit, this movie is going to be 45 minutes long. Okay, let's make two COVID killers. Yes. And then they just got your long lost evil twin. Uh. One E Billiams <laughs> and, and, and and put him in a mask and then made him kill people with a hammer that makes uh cartoon sound effects when you when you hit people over the head with them. And the chief of police or whatever she was. Yeah. They named her Felicia for that one lame fucking joke. Mm-hmm. They mm-hmm. named her, the character Felicia so he could walk out the door. And say goodbye, Felicia. Yeah. Like, holy fuck. I had the hardest time. Hurt. I had the hardest time sitting and watching this film. I'm having a hard time just sitting here talking about it. This movie sucked. Well, and at times it felt like it was a bit anti mask. Uh, 10 minutes. 10 minutes. It felt like it, it felt like at times that. The first thing that happened was that someone made a rap album and then just made a movie around it. Yes. It, it's, it, it felt like that a lot. 
it felt like the filmmakers cared more about a shoe collection and and a, a one really nice car than an actual plot. Uh fuck. Um this and of course, I, I mentioned this before, but like, uh, does everyone in Brooklyn just talk like this? That is, that is, I, I that's not, that's not, I am, I'm possibly a suburb in Long Island or New Jersey. Possibly. Hey, welcome that to is, McDee's. What can I freaking get you? In no can, way, you could see the roofs of things. In no way that's Brooklyn or the fucking Bronx. What can you friggin' get me? You can get me a number two. You busting my balls or what? No, I ain't busting your balls. Hey, fuck you, you friggin' jabroni. I did kind of like Dollar General Sam Kennison. <laughs> oh, oh, hold on. I wrote that down. I wrote that down. Bunny, you know I like my coffee the way I like my women. Tall, black, and... Sexy. <laughs> that it, and it's like okay, this is a ridiculous, horrible drunk, and then suddenly, hey, Captain, are you on the bottle again? It's like, wait, this guy's a fucking cop. Am I? <laughs> what? God, this sucks. Oh, I hate this movie, and that's the amazing thing. And we mentioned this earlier. I thought that nothing can be could be worse than last week's movie, COVID-19 Invasion, starring big, sexy WCW killer Kevin Nash in a starring cameo role. But it's like every week we hit the worst COVID exploitation film. Every week we see a new, shittier film. And it's crazy to think about. But still, yes. out of all the movies that we saw, the best one has been 2025 The World Enslaved by a Virus, a pro Christian anti coronavirus movie by a German child groomer. Yes. Fuck! Yes. That's so fucking weird. And then, like, there were a couple of scenes in this film that seemed like they were stolen from other films. I noticed that, like, oh, what are you two doing? Beating this guy up. We caught the COVID killer. Oh, wait, it's not the COVID killer. And I'm like, yeah, that's, yeah, I also saw that uh, John Leguizamo Summer of Sam movie. Yeah. So, and then the ending is stolen from, I don't remember the name, but it's a Stallone movie. Before he was Stallone? And there's yeah. a killer, and he's going to kill somebody, but oh, it's Sylvester Stallone in drag. Oh, no, oh, yeah, 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 no, no, yeah, yeah. Nighthawks. Fucking Nighthawks. Nighthawks. That yeah, was the, the Lindsay, the, the, that was supposed to be Lindsay Wagner. Yeah. But Stallone dressed up as Lizzie, Lindsay Wagner because totally the same body type. Yeah. That's 100% you know, the ending of the COVID killer. They stole it from Nighthawk. Stallone is a lot more life than you would think. Yeah. You know? And it's like, it's like damn, that's that Stallone movie. Fuck. Yeah. But they catch the that COVID killer. That was a good movie. Yeah, it was. They caught the COVID killer, but they didn't catch the COVID copycat killer. They're leaving it open for a sequel. How yeah. excited are you, Bonnie, for the sequel? Uh, about not at all. Okay, they haven't announced it yet. I'm assuming that they will eventually do it. It's not like Jeff Kennedy would ever say no to a project. I is is something that I think I can safely say. Okay, so and then we had a fucking movie in a movie. Yeah. What the hell was that about? So. We've seen, okay, so, so far this summer, we've seen 2025, The World Enslaved by a Virus, a pro-Christian anti-coronavirus movie, which was shit, uh, but, but it was so bad it was funny. Then we watched the Mitesh Patel film, Anti-Coronavirus, a.k.a. Fake Crying the Movie, which was horrible. Then I said, oh, right. this will be with, fun. With the, my pillow guy. Yeah. So then I said, oh, this will be fun. Corona zombies. How was how was Corona Zombie so unfun? I couldn't tell you a 
thing that happened in that movie, other than it was a ripoff of a of a Woody Allen film. He should have cut in more movies. I mean, that yeah. was a weird ass choice of two movies. They must have yeah. just had the rights to them. So then we did Corona. Fear is a fear is a virus, which all took place in an elevator. Yes, which was horrible. And then I last thought that week, was kind of fun. I, I fucking hated that movie <laughs> so bad. The people in an elevator yelling the movie. Can you the believe woman wants this was to check the dead girl's lifeline to see if it was vanishing. Yeah. Yeah. I rigged the elevator to stop. How the fuck did you rig the elevator to stop? You press the button. Fucking ridiculous. And then we it watched COVID-19. Stop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then we watched COVID-19 invasion last week and this week we watched the COVID killer. Next week our movie next week. Is it gonna suck? Fucking probably. But at least it will be different. Okay. The next movie we're watching is the 2021 film The Coronavirus Conspiracy. Now, I have never watched this film, but I know what it's about. It's a comedic thriller about the following things. The Coronavirus zookeepers, the importance of memes, aliens, and Harambe. Oh! I guarantee you, you are not ready for this, but it, you hear all those things, and those are all in the plot of the film. I don't think it's going to be good, but at least it will be different. Yes. So... A comedic thriller, the coronavirus conspiracy. I'm just going to let you know right now, you're not ready for it. You're not ready. For it. <laughs> and this is all leading up to our final film. The only big budget film that the only big budget COVID exploitation film that is out there, uh, which I haven't found yet, but I am going to find a copy of. And that is Songbird starring Archie from Riverdale. And for some reason, Demi Moore. Yes. Uh, really excited to watch that because it actually had money as opposed to the rest of these pieces of shit. But that is our next episode. The Coronavirus Conspiracy about memes, aliens, and Harambe and computer simulations. It is some weird ass shit and you're not ready for it. This week's movie, The COVID Killer. It's bad, but not even in a good way. Not even in a funny way. No. It's just bad. It's just bad, bad. On the positive side, you can look at it and say, hey, I could make that. So if anything, it's a self-improvement. You know, it, it, it helps give you confidence for your own project. But uh, next episode, the coronavirus conspiracy. But now that I'm looking back at this episode, the highs, the lows, Jeff Kennedy, Howard Stern, Disney groomers, um, estrogen. I got to say, I think this has been a pretty good episode. This has been a damn good episode. Hey, damn, a to double hear you damn say. good episode. A rare double damn. We got a rare double damn. Well, hot damn for the rare double damn. Uh, I, I concur with your assessment, good sir. So until next week, I am Bunny Williams. And I am Reverend Steve Maylin. And on behalf of Natasha and Eleanor and Mal and everybody else, I just want to say thanks for listening. And we will see you next week, you godless heathens. Hurry, we've got less than a minute. you do shuffles and poopy touch. And you COVID zombies. And you cookies. Nice. Do 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 do. Cut and prayer. Yes, we got it all in. Cut and print. USA, USA. Uh. The chant. Hi, everybody. It's me. <laughs>